do you feel there's also a group of people that, that are maybe trying to use this issue to, to further a different agenda? Protesters are protesting for a certain reason, but every, every time I, I go to an area where they protest, it's, it's dirtier than a dump pile. Okay, I'm here with uh, Joe Skin of Skin Tai Nation. Uh, thank you, Joe, for taking the time to chat with us in this beautiful uh, hotel and bar, which I know you're going to talk a little bit about uh, in greater depth shortly. Yeah. But uh, first off, if you could uh, tell everyone a little bit about uh, yourself as far as where you're from. Uh, I know you went and worked up in uh, Fort Nelson, is that yeah. correct? And then uh, made your way uh, back down uh, here uh, south of Francois Lake. And uh, we're on the band council during a very transformative time for, for your nation, your community, regarding the coastal gas link pipeline. But first off, I, I'm just very curious about what it was like growing up in such a small community um, and, and what that was like and any challenges uh, and opportunities that you faced. Uh, growing up around here, uh, like you said, it was very challenging. Um, I grew up across uh, south of Francis Lake. There wasn't much opportunity for First Nations back uh, back then. Um, my dad uh, had on employment on and off, and most of the time we got. Uh, got anything new, I had to go to the dump pile with my dad to scrounge around for odds and ends that people threw away, you know. So it was a lifestyle that was difficult like that and made me into a stronger person growing up. Uh, but I never gave up, you know, I never went the easy route, you know. And and you talk a little bit about how you, or why you decided to get involved in in band politics, I guess I guess you, you call it, and, and running for election the first time, and, and what was that like? And was any of your family ever uh, involved in, in band politics, or you kind of the first one to get involved? No, I wasn't the first one. Uh, my older brother uh, was the chief of uh, our band before I even had the idea of running for band council. Okay. Yeah, and the reason why I wanted to try to run for band council was because uh, seeing my band go through the ringer from shady band counselors in the past, you know, I wanted to make an example of what a good leader would do for his community. That's one of the main reasons why I ran for band council. Wow, so, uh, and you were dealing with Coastal Gas Link pretty much right away, that Right project. from the beginning, yeah. Yeah, and how, how was that? That was obviously such a, uh, new kind of initiative for your community and there was there were some people for it some people against it and and you were this new kind of young counselor at the forefront of that what what was that like in a in a community with mixed opinions and in the beginning everybody was dead set against it uh close to gas links they they didn't want to nothing to do with it because uh, like i said before they they were all uneducated in the process or or what what type of steps they needed to make sure that uh, our traditional territory would uh, stay intact and, and not compromised with uh, any damages, you know, to like hunting or fishing or anything like that, any harvesting processes that we have in our culture. And once we got that out, out of the way and explained in depth more to our community, it took at least uh, three, three and a half years to explain to our, our uh, band members who were opposed to the idea of uh, CGL, Coastal Gas Link. And once we, we explained in depth uh, uh, the process and how it wasn't pictured the way that they thought it was, you know, dangerous, uh, oil bitumen, it's no good for our community, you know. we reiterated everything to them that uh, it wasn't going to be bitumen pipeline, it's going to be a uh, natural gas. And once we explained to them that there was already a, a natural gas pipeline going through our, many people's territories in BC already for the last 50 or 60 years already, nothing's come of that, that pipeline already. And once they started seeing that, uh, they started uh, 
being more for CGL. And and did you um, decide as a council, did you hold any kind of votes in your community? or did yep. you get a set? Yeah. Yep, we had uh, ongoing meetings, um, not just in our community. We, we took the initiative to go out of our own community, our traditional territory, because we have so many band members that live off reserve. Okay. We have band members that occupy in uh, Dawson Creek area, Prince George area, and Vancouver. Okay. So we went to all those areas and we had discussions with all of our band members uh, on uh, the topics that they wanted to discuss, uh, their concerns and everything. And once we answered all those with all of our band members, uh, we started getting everybody to, to buy into the idea of uh, CGL. Okay, and what was um, what was CGL like to work with? Obviously, they they approached you at at, at some point as a, as as a nation, uh, and that was obviously a new new experience for for everyone in, in Skin Tie Nation. And what was that process like? Was it kind of was it overwhelming? Was it exciting? Was it uh, a, a a mix of the two? Was it? I think it was a mix of uh, the two. Um, we weren't too sure of what we were getting into or what we were about to sign on to. Um, we had, like I said, the discussions lasted about three to three and a half years with CGL before the benefits agreements were signed. And we had lots of questions, lots of concerns. They answered it for us and they made sure that uh, we, were, we were feeling comfortable as possible and we appreciated that they treated us uh, very respectfully and professionally. And what were some of the the uh, benefits that you were able to see from that from that agreement, or that you expect to see down the road? I know we're we're sitting in a pretty uh, uh, beautifully renovated hotel and and restaurant, and and really I would call it a community gathering place, a place yeah. where everyone can kind of get together. Yeah, that's and that's kind of connected to to that, right? Yeah, some of the benefits that uh, came from the agreements that we signed, the benefit agreements with CGL, uh, we're actually, like you said, we're sitting in one right now, um, the Lakeland Hotel. Uh, we bought that with the benefits agreements uh, that we got from CGL for our community. And our community will prosper from this within the next uh, two years or so. Yeah, but I, I know, uh, Financially, obviously, but also I feel from a, a community almost health perspective of everyone being able to gather and having that place, and it really is a, a beautiful, uh, a, a beautiful building. And I'm sure you're excited for it to get fully open and operational. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's a, it's a long time in the making for yeah. us right now for our community, our band especially, not just our band, but like I said, the, the Burns Lake community. It's uh, one of the oldest buildings in Burns Lake, so. And how do you feel like you must, um, I don't want to put myself uh, in, in your shoes or words in your mouth, but as someone uh, with your background and then being elected to council, helping to negotiate that agreement with Coastal GasLink, helping to be part of such a beautiful reno renovation, uh, a father um, of, of four children, right, you mentioned, uh, you must feel a sense of pride and accomplishment, like just by looking around, like how yeah. does that, like that must, like I like I I'm moved by this this yeah. story here and just yeah. like looking around at this. It's every time I come come by here or through here, uh, I'm just in awe of the opportunity that I was uh, part of. Yeah, yeah. And I guess it's continuing uh, to this day because obviously it's it's still ongoing and there's yeah. a lot of uh, uh, it, and and to that point on kind of the um, the employment and opportunity side. Would you, for people in your community, has Coastal Gasling created a bunch of opportunities that, for op, for employment and stable families and stuff that didn't exist before? Yep, yeah, that's for sure. There, there's a lot of uh, opportunities that our, our band members benefit from CGL right now. Uh, we have uh, quite a few members that are working on the pipeline, and they're able to provide for their families like they, on a level they 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 haven't been before, you know. And that's that's very beneficial and something to be proud of. I'm very proud of. And now, of course, um, regardless of what the issue is, you're never going to get 100% of people to agree on on anything. Yeah, you'll always have uh, the blowback of uh, some individuals yeah. because they they obviously either don't partake in it or don't want to partake in it. 
and has that been, uh, you might, you're elected, elected counselor, so I guess you had to develop a little bit of a thick skin maybe when dealing with, with, with some of these issues or? Politic, or politics is very, very um, gruesome. Yeah. Yeah, um, cutthroat, you gotta be like a pirate. So. <laughs> yeah, a pirate, that's, yeah. A, that's a good way of putting it. What would you say, I mean, there's the people that are obviously uh, just have a difference of opinion, aren't, aren't going to be able to, to see the other side, or they just, whatever, they're, they're weighing different, different values differently. Uh, do you feel there's also a group of people that, that are maybe trying to use this issue to, to further a different agenda down in the lower mainland in Victoria, or is it totally not your concern and you're just happy doing what you can for your community, or do you see any of that? Does it frustrate you? It doesn't frustrate me, um, but uh, I do, I do feel like it benefits their own agenda and not the agenda that uh, they say they're doing, you know, like the protesters are protesting for a certain reason, but every every time I, I go to an area where they protest, it's, it's dirtier than a dump pile, mm -hmm. you know, and that just bothers me. Uh, that's why I say that they're, they're protesting for their own agenda and not for being against the pipeline because if they were they wouldn't be leaving leaving garbage and and a, a huge footprint where they're protesting of course and one of the issues that keeps coming up and you must you're in such a great position to kind of answer this question because you were an elected councillor for a first nation band is is kind of this conversation or, or argument almost about who speaks for First Nations. You always have like one side saying we speak for First Nations, the other side's pulling the other way. How, how do you how do you navigate? How do you navigate that? How do you, speaking to Canadians, like how do you, who does speak for First Nations? What groups should people look toward? For our, our community we, we have an elected, uh, a custom elected system which we follow and the majority votes who they want in to speak on their behalf and th those are the individuals who speak on the people's behalf for our community the skin tell you nation this is our custom election code that's that's how what we follow right and is that something is that obviously i guess each i'm reading between the lines here but but each first nation is is different is different, uh, is different. Yeah. Right, and, and you guys, I guess, are, uh, the way Skin Tai Nation does it, is that something that you think is a good system, is a, is a satisfactory system? Uh, it's good enough for right now. It's good enough for right uh, now. But just like everything else in time, it eventually has to change. Right. You have to change with, with uh, the momentum that uh, in the direction you want to go or you're going. And I guess actually that's a, that's a perfect uh, a segue to my next question. Uh, things are always changing, we're always growing, obviously the world around us is changing, but uh, history and tradition and culture are obviously uh, very important because it's, it's where we came from mm -hmm. and what makes us who we are. Uh, how important is, are those things for you and, and your community and how do you go about uh, preserving them, especially in, in smaller nations like Skin Tight Nation? Well, us um, preserving our traditions and our culture, we have to do it with uh, by word of mouth with our kids right now, uh, because uh, I made a post um, in 2019 on Facebook and on Twitter that went viral. Um, the hereditary system um, doesn't do its part by making sure that we we know those traditions and cultures for our children, so we. As a band, when I was on council, we made sure that we invested some of our, our funds to make sure that we, we kept these traditions and cultures alive in our community for future generations. So oh, wow. we basically had to invest in our, our own band's funds to make sure that uh, we kept those alive. Oh, wow. And uh, maybe on that note, uh, what do you see as the greatest challenges uh, for your community, First Nations in general, kind of going forward, and uh, the challenges that they're facing today, and and maybe some possible solutions to those. Some of the challenges our, our band faces right now is um, 
information, you know, where they get their information from, or, or um, some of them's misinterpreted or, or misguided by, by certain individuals with their own agenda, you know, and things like that make it difficult. But it doesn't stop us. You know, like uh, we have a system for our community with uh, leaders that get voted in every five years. And those individuals have five years to do their best to make a positive impact for our band. That makes a lot of sense. Well, it's uh, been a real pleasure talking to you, Joe, and I think uh, I hope the people watching take this as, as an inspiration. What, what you obviously didn't do it by yourself, but no, the, no, the I, I served on band council with uh, one of the youngest chiefs at the time in BC, uh, Renee Skin, and uh, another individual, uh, Bobby Skin, and these these are the individuals who who aided uh, me into making all of this possible for our community. And I mean, just looking around, uh, it's it's real. <laughs> tangible changes and improvements and yeah. and I'm sure you're, you're proud of it I'm sure your family is especially proud of it young family oh yeah and they have a great uh, role model growing up for sure and uh, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me and, and helping you know shed the light uh, to Canadians about about what's actually happening in the communities because I think uh, everyone these days you kind of alluded to it gets in their own little little yeah. bubble um, and it's good to have these kind of conversations and, and kind of sh share your stories with me. And it's, it's been very uh, illuminating. And I think, I'm, I'm sure it has been for many Canadians as well. So thank, thank you very much for uh, yeah. taking the time. No problem. Uh, people get uh, the proper information uh, once, once they start um, having more interviews like this, you know, getting the information from the horse's mouth instead of the rear end of the horse, <laughs> you know. That's... Uh, I couldn't have put it better myself, so yeah. thank you very much. No problem, man. Thank you.